good to be uh, see you again, and we'll uh, talk about uh, a new subject. And I have a lot to say on this, so I hope I don't run out of time, but I'll try to go fast. I've been assigned the topic for this talk as natural history and pathological process of the glaucomas, but the uh, the actual subtitle is what the topic will be. That is, what is glaucoma? Now. Diseases in general, and glaucoma for two, uh, really are determined by uh, people in lo localities uh, and not good communication necessarily between civilizations. For example, here we got, we got China, they, they had their ideas about glaucoma and what might be causing it in India and uh, in, uh, Middle East and uh, then Greece and Rome and, and so on spreading into the rest of Europe and finally ending up also in the United States. Uh, in each place, they had a different theory of medicine with regard to uh, whether it was caused by humors or, or karma or what caused the disease and what its nature was and they gave a name to it. Um, uh, naming conventions are different and so on. And the communication wasn't good until just very, very recently. In fact, when I was uh, contemplating my fellowship, I had my residency in San Francisco and uh, I wanted to just stay there and take my glaucoma fellowship, but uh, they recommended that I go over to the East Coast and take my fellowship there. I had already learned what they had to say about glaucoma uh, on the West Coast and they said, you'll find something entirely different on their attitudes and approaches on the East Coast. And they indeed turned out to be right. And I would ask them on the East Coast, why did you do that? And they said, they give me an explanation. And I always wanted to go back to the people on the West Coast and say, they told me this on the East Coast. Why do, did you teach me what you taught me on the West Coast? So the, uh, there's not going to be a standard uh, that applies to the whole world. Disease is a disturbance of the ease in one's life. It can be an infection or an injury, a mental state or anything else. Our word glaucoma comes from the Greek word, which was an adjective describing a, a light blue or light green or maybe a gray haze in the front part of the eye. And it could be attributed to uh, cataract or corneal edema, uh, or even being blue eyed. So that if you were Scandinavian, you would be uh, tagged with having this color uh, of glaucose on your eye. Now the Greek word glaucose evolved to glaucoma and the word glaucoma appeared in the English language in the mid 17th century. Uh, and here's what cloudiness in the anterior segment looked like. So it could be corneal haze, or it could be lens haze. They didn't make the distinction at first anyway. And uh, uh, both of those would be called uh, having the color glauco, uh, that is a greenish blue haze. In this case, behind the pupil. In this case, maybe not behind the pupil, although it might not notice the corneal haze. You only notice the difference in color. In many of the societies, a hazy pupil was uh, recognized as a haze behind the pupil, and they did call it cataract. The cataracts, when recognized, were treated by couching. Couching was a procedure in which a needle was inserted into the eye, generally through the pars plana, engaging the cataract and pushing it downwards uh, to the inferior uh, bottom of the eye. And uh, the best surgeons were the ones who could do that in one fell swoop in less than a second and get it over with, does it hurt? <clears throat> anyway, uh, it did benefit many cases, not all, and not always for a long time because sometimes the lens would uh, set up an inflammation in the eye and you'd lose your vision again. Glaucoma, or at least not having cataract, 
would be defined by haziness that was not corrected by couching. Amorosis was a diagnosis that was used for darkening of vision with no apparent cause in the front part of the eye as seen with the available light source of the day, which was a candle or maybe an oil lamp or maybe sunlight coming in through the window. And most often the fireplace, uh, the hearth was had a fire going continuously and it illuminated the room so you could get around and see what you were doing and so on and so forth. So darkening of vision with no evident cause in the anterior segment was something of a puzzle. And the only thing you could do is to say, well, patient has amaurosis. Recognize they probably weren't all the same thing. Uh, it included, uh, nowadays we would recognize retinal detachment, macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, and, and chronic glaucoma. So the characteristics of glaucoma were a hard eye, which is recognized as uh, pain and redness, a hazy cornea, and an iridectomy was sometimes beneficial. Now, the idea behind iridectomy was that the iris caused toxic humors inside the eye and it made for uh, cloudy cornea and so on. And if they could just get rid of some of the iris that are producing this toxic humor, why maybe they would benefit the eye. And so an iridectomy became uh, the thing to do and it did. Uh, change things. Rock hard eyes were recognized in the uh, uh, people that had cloudiness and the hardness went away, maybe because uh, of a relief of pupillary block or maybe due to some filtration that occurred. Anyway, iridectomies were performed and the bigger the better to get rid of the most iris. The eyes did get softer uh, either because it opened the angle or there was a fistula and vision improved, at least for a time. Now, the question is, how could you possibly see inside the eye and figure out what was going on with amaurosis? Well, we won't talk about Murray, uh, if that's how you pronounce his name. <clears throat> we can imagine that. Uh, Perkinji had accidentally seen the inside of the eye of uh, some animals. In 1847, a mathematician figured out what the problem was and he uh, described how you might be able to look in the eye by proper placement of light and uh, your viewpoint. But it was independently discovered by Helmholtz three years later and he's the one that gets credit for developing ophthalmoscopy. The problem is that the pupils are black. Why is that a problem? That's a problem because the illumination in the room illuminates only part of the retina, the candle, let's say. And the part of the retina that you're looking at when you look straight into the eye is in a dark place. It's not illuminated. And so the pupils are black. It's the eye is constructed so that light doesn't bounce around inside. And that's, you know, the role, part of the role of the pigment epithelium is to keep light from doing that and uh, making a haze and a glow over everything. Um, and so the problem is that you're looking at a part of the retina that's not illuminated. And so the correction for that problem is to have an apparatus like Helmholtz device, where he had a candle. So here's a candle. And he had a mirror which uh, reflected the light into the eye. And he looked through a hole in the mirror right at the part of the retina that was illuminated. Here's an optical uh, diagram of that, the candle, uh, the, the uh, hole in the mirror through which the, the uh, person could view the fundus of the light with the light that was already reflected in there. Just to go off on a tangent for a moment about the ophthalmoscope, it, it was in fact the single most important event in all time for understanding eye diseases. 
all those diseases that were called amaurosis could now be visualized and seen. Helmholtz recognized that this was an important invention, but he refused to patent it because he thought that he was willing to make uh, ophthalmoscopes and sell them, but the idea and the concept should be known widely away, you know, in different places so that other people could build them too. And he didn't want to patent it. As a result, 50 years later, when there was a celebration at a meeting of the 50th anniversary of uh, uh, di the discovery of a, or invention of an uh, ophthalmoscope, why there were already 350 different modifications that were presented uh, that uh, did certain things. One of the modifications was to hook the light source up to electricity, which didn't come along until about 1900. So for the first 50 years, why there was a candle, uh, but now, now it could use electricity. The problem is electricity was provided by a, uh, a uh, dry, a wet cell like a car battery, and then there had to be a wire that went to the ophthalmoscope. And you can see in use, there's a wire here for the ophthalmoscope that's running up to the ophthalmoscope that's being used, and had been invented to be just a single direct ophthalmoscope instead of the previous indirect. Somebody got the idea in 1915 to put the battery in the handle because now dry cells of smaller size were available. You couldn't put that car battery in the handle, but you could put the dry cell in the handle. <clears throat> and it was commercialized finally uh, by actually being built after the concept of Crown come by Welsh and Allen. And they became a prominent company for a lot of optical instruments, uh, but they were the first to develop or let's say commercialize a uh, uh, direct ophthalmoscope. The impact on ophthalmoscopy was amazing. <clears throat> there had been a long standing puzzle of just exactly what was amaurosis. There were many guesses and speculations, theories and discussions, and all became meaningless because now you could look inside and you could see. Okay, back from the tangent, Ah, returning to the subject at hand, what is the nature of glaucoma? A new concept, concept of glaucoma emerged early. At first, glaucoma uh, had no apparent changes in the fundus. The retina looked fine. And it was uh, when the, somebody looked at the disc, they thought that it was swollen. Uh, and uh, that was the finding in glaucoma, but they had the stereo reversed and von Grafe uh, explained and found and showed that the, uh, actually it's an excavation in the disc that is occurring uh, and not, uh, well, and he saw retinal pulsations when the pressure was high enough. So glaucoma had loss of vision, a very high pressure, rock hard, at least in some cases, and excavation of the disc. How do these fit, fit together? We could ask, what's the central feature of glaucoma? Well, it's the pressure. That became the defining element for glaucoma. Hard as a rock, recognized as far back as 1600. By palpation, the firmness uh, could be uh, detected and some eyes weren't quite hard as a rock, but they were firm nonetheless, firmer than normal eyes. And by 1952, nine degrees of firmness were described. It was decided that maybe we needed to have some instruments that would actually measure the pressure. And these were under development over the next 50 years. Uh, and but not widespread, not very practical until Shiatz um, developed his tonometer in 1905. It had to be calibrated, and this was done in 1948 and again in 1955 as a correction. <laughs> Later out, and it turned out the 1948 one was probably the more accurate one anyway. Uh, but meanwhile, applination tonometers came around, 
because indentation tonometers tended to change the pressure artificially by the indentation of the eye by the tonometer. So applanation uh, tonometers came along and the one that became popular of course was the uh, uh, one by Goldman, which is used to this day as being the standard. All tonometers estimate pressure, they don't really measure it. And um, so as long as you have a particular estimate that might be good enough uh, as long as it's repeatable time after time after time. So the types of glaucoma were defined on the basis of what made the high intraocular pressure. That is a pressure over 21 millimeters of mercury. And this is about the time that I started my residency is when this was uh, defined. Primary glaucoma was defined. And there were three kinds, open angle, because they now recognized that there was also angle closure, but didn't know what caused the angle closure. So it was primary angle closure. And then there was primary congenital glaucoma, three kinds. Uh, the word primary being the same as idiopathic, meaning you really didn't know what came before it and what caused it. It was as if the pressure arose spontaneously on its own. It was primary. It was the thing that started the disease process. So the angle was open and something happened to cause the pressure to go up because the angle was open. So the angle could be closed, congenital. And then there were secondary glaucomas. All of these glaucomas were tabulated in a textbook by Becker and Schaefer, which uh, was available by the mid 1900s. And it included a complete listing and description of all kinds of glaucomas, uh, pigment dispersion, pseudoexfoliation, trauma, and so on. There were several dozen uh, different types of glaucoma, some of which were presented differently uh, clinically, some of which required different treatments, uh, but they were all described and that became the standard. Still, it was an elevated intraocular pressure and the classification was on the basis of what caused the elevated pressure. So when I was a young eagle and no white feathers in my head, it was all about intraocular pressure. Glaucoma defined as a pressure over 21 millimeters of mercury or equal to 21. The type of glaucoma was defined on what caused that. And the treatment was based on the intraocular pressure, the goal being to bring the intraocular pressure into the normal range, that is below 21 millimeters of mercury, period. It was as simple as that. So this was the, the viewpoint of glaucoma at that time. There was a distribution of normal pressures going up to 21 millimeters of mercury. And at 21 millimeters of mercury, you began to be defined as having glaucoma. And that pressure was abnormal and unsafe and caused loss of vision. And so if you found someone in this pressure range, they were defined as having glaucoma. And in this pressure range, they did not have glaucoma. How things have changed. Now, the viewpoint is that there is a range of pressure, all right, and it's skewed. And there, that uh, skew goes all the way into eyes that don't have any cupping and feel loss. And so that's the, the whole normal range, or the whole range right there of normal eyes. There still is a mean pressure around 17. And there's a standard deviation, even though it's not quite Gaussian, there's a skew uh, and the standard deviation, two and a half, brings you up to the cutoff point of 21 millimeters of mercury. That stays the same as being the usual pressure. But if you look at which eyes lost vision, they have a distribution that looks like this. Now, there really weren't any that were down this low. That's, that's the artist's uh, thickness of their line so to speak, the, you really started to see some people that had glaucomatous cupping and feel loss uh, in, the, in this range of 15 to 21. Uh, that was a puzzle because <clears throat> the, everybody knows that glaucoma starts 
than a pressure of 21. Then there were people that were had a pressure over 21 that didn't have uh, loss of vision. Fact is, there were more of those than there were people who had lost vision. That was sort of puzzling, but still the definition was um, two standard deviations above the mean intraocular pressure. Armley started to study this and he looked and he saw according to age that there was a tendency for an increased intraocular pressure and the average pressure was, you know, something uh, or having an abnormal pressure above 20 millimeters of mercury was more frequent. That's what this is. This is frequency. And having glaucoma, as we define it today with field loss, that also increased with age, but was not the frequency as having a high pressure. Only some people with high pressure had glaucoma. And that was puzzling for a while there, but confirmed by other people that this solid line is the observations of the intraocular pressure in the population. And this dotted line is a Gaussian distribution so you see that it is skewed somewhat to the right. And what we have down here are the people who had loss of vision in shaded form. So these shaded people here, they had loss of vision. Whereas the ones that are just enclosed by a line like here, they didn't have loss of vision and neither did these people, including a couple of them you see that really had quite eccentric uh, uh, pressures, you know, above 30 or even 40. Yeah, so we have glaucoma in these people here, typified by an elevated intraocular pressure and field loss. We have a group down here, which shouldn't have loss of vision because their pressure is normal. And then we have some outliers of people that had normal vision, even though their pressure was abnormal. But that's also true of this group here, above 21 millimeters of mercury. All of these people have ocular hypertension without field loss. Huh. Well, there was more studies done and all of them showed the same thing, just like Armley had shown uh, that uh, the frequency of having ocular hypertension rose with age, but loss of vision doing the cupping and field loss also raised with age, but not to the degree that intraocular pressure did. Well, that meant that reality didn't hit, fit with the theory that the intraocular pressure was the central thing and caused damage to the nerve excavation. Oh, well, that makes sense. You know, pressure pushing on the nerve uh, pushes it back and balloons it out. So what's, what's this business with ocular hypertension? Well, maybe it just takes time. And what we've seen is people that have the pressure and it hasn't taken time yet to push out the optic nerve and damage it. But uh, in the end, it was believed that high intraocular pressure was harmful and best to get it on the patient on treatment to prevent the harm from even starting. And, and what about the people that had normal pressure? Well, maybe they had a pressure high in the past. A typical example might be somebody used corticosteroids to make their contact lenses more comfortable. They had high pressure during that time. Later in life, they stopped the corticosteroids because they stopped wearing the contact lens and they were discovered to have cupping and field loss, but normal intraocular pressure because they were no longer using the steroids. Or there could be some past vascular episode or some optic atrophy in association with physiologic cupping uh, because even physiologic cupping yet hadn't been uh, separated from glaucoma cupping. 
And uh, I was taught in residency that you couldn't tell glaucomatous cupping from physiologic cupping unless it was total cupping, but that physiologic covering, cupping went to full range and you really couldn't identify it until it was total. And how did you explain normal tension glaucoma? High pressure in the past or some other event, uh, no longer present. <coughs> you see, glaucoma is all about high intraocular pressure, stupid. These other things don't matter. It's just pressure. So there. Well, in 60 years, there's been change in this. Our only first question, as we just talked about, uh, wh whether the high intraocular pressure defines glaucoma and the necessity for treatment. Bo Bankston and others people in Sweden, they question whether the intraocular pressure and cupping and feel loss were actually two separate conditions of the eye unrelated to each other, but with overlap, some people had both as they both increased with age. <clears throat> uh, some people ha had both, but pressure didn't cause the cupping and feel loss. So there was no reason to treat the pressure. That was the problem that, that they uncovered. Eddie is, was an epidemiologist uh, type person in general medicine, and he was introduced the concept of evidence-based medicine, where you had to have evidence for uh, what caused the disease and what treated it effectively. You, you couldn't just speculate, well, the pressure is going, uh, causing the cupping and feel loss, but you had to show that treating the pressure had some benefit. Up till then, in all of medicine, uh, it was just what the professor said or what made sense from facts that you knew. And it did make sense that intraocular pressure would excavate the nerve. And so that you would go by that. But he, he emphasized again and again that you didn't have, you had to have evidence. And he annoyed ophthalmologists no end because he was questioning the long standing basis for uh, treating glaucoma or treating ocular hypertension that uh, the intraocular pressure was the culprit. Um, and he challenged that and made everybody in ophthalmology mad because they were having their whole practice pattern and the conventional wisdom was being challenged. So how should we think about intraocular pressure now? Well, intraocular pressure was used for screening in the community for a long time because it was central to the concept of glaucoma and people would have high pressure and then they would be found to have glaucoma. Uh, now in glaucoma, the intraocular pressure is used uh, in management by setting an intraocular pressure target, a concept uh, that Paul Pomberg has uh, uh, advocated. Um, so recognizing that sometimes the pressure under 20 is harmful, you may want to set the target pressure to be uh, 15 or maybe something less than that. And in people that had a very high pressure, let's say 35, oh, maybe getting the pressure down to 23 is good enough. Not yet in the normal range, but maybe good enough. So it no longer had to think about intraocular pressure uh, being set to the normal level, but being set to a safe level. When you start treatment, you monitor the intraocular pressure to see the effectiveness of the treatment. Did it lower the pressure? Or uh, did it low, lower it to the target intraocular pressure? And eventually what you do is uh, you, you monitor whether it stayed at the target pressure. Of course, you also uh, monitor whether or not there is more cupping and more field loss because these characterize glaucoma in addition to intraocular pressure. <clears throat> How do we detect glaucoma? Well, intraocular pressure is a risk factor along with age, family history, and cardiovascular status, and, and so, other, so many other things. So uh, it is something that you use to detect glaucoma. You also detect it by looking at the optic desk and seeing uh, whether or not it's abnormal. Uh, you might not do that 
uh, if you hadn't really checked the intraocular pressure and considered that to be a risk factor along with these other things. And, and that's a problem uh, because as we saw, if you just check the intraocular pressure, you're gonna have some false positives for, for one thing, but you're also gonna have half of the people that have a normal pressure and yet they have glaucoma. So disc evaluation becomes important. Now the question about intraocular pressure, how often do we do that? We do it every visit, don't we? Is that necessary? Uh, should we check it? Well, we should take the opportunity to check the intraocular pressure when somebody comes in for with blurred vision and they need a pair of glasses and we should check the uh, intraocular pressure as part of our examination, e even if uh, we don't have any reason to suspect glaucoma. That's a good thing to do, but we don't have to do it often. We don't have to do it as often as we do. It's become kind of habit to do it on every single visit. Disc evaluation should be done from time to time. It's much more sensitive to detecting uh, glaucoma. And visual fields, a place for visual fields is to uh, detect uh, uh, whether or not the cupping is abnormal or not. So after intraocular pressure, we characterize the disc features in glaucoma. And that should, that we're gonna do that separately. Um, but for starters, physiologic cupping occurs. It's not the cup disc ratio that matters. What happens is that nerve fibers are entering the optic disc from all directions. And as they make their 90 degree turn to leave the eye, they're, they're visible as a pink rim in the optic disc all around the circumference. If the opening in the sclera is larger, then all the axons leaving the eye don't take up as much room around the rim, and there's a larger leftover excavation in the middle. But there's no loss of nerve fibers, no effect on vision. It's still physiologic. Can you tell the difference? between that and glaucoma? Well, I don't know, there seems to be a rim of tissue around here in this cup. But the strange thing is that there's an area where there's not as much in the way of nerve fibers. Huh. It's not the size of the excavation that makes the difference, like the cup disc ratio, but here we have an area in the disc where very subtly there's not as much disc tissue, not as many nerve fibers coming around. And in keeping with that, they're in a visual field, and this is not familiar to most of us today. This is the Goldman field at the time when being in use at the time when all this was being discovered. Uh, and there were abnormalities, you see, in the visual field. Uh, that correspond to the loss of nerve fibers that were uh, entering the top of the disc. There are these abnormalities beginning at the bottom. So you think you can tell the difference between physiologic and glaucoma cupping now? We'll talk about that later. For something different, we can now talk about what are the underlying mechanisms, first of all, for elevated intraocular pressure, and secondly, for damage to the optic disc? Intraocular pressure is determined by resistance in the deep trabecular meshwork and the inner wall of Schlem's canal. To a lesser degree, there is some resistance circumferentially in Schlem's canal and in the collector channels. And then there's also the episcleral venous pressure. These are the things that determine the intraocular pressure. For a couple of decades, tonography was used to measure this resistance, but it was clinically found not to be useful any more than intraocular pressure itself. We now understand that there are control mechanisms and biochemical homeostasis uh, in the trabecular meshwork uh, 
that determine whether or not uh, the resistance becomes abnormal. And these are being studied. Um, I don't know very much about these mechanisms and won't take time to cover all of them. However, uh, at least one medication has come from uh, efforts to understand this resistance. Rho kinase is involved in cell contraction and a rho kinase inhibitor is now on the market to uh, lower intraocular pressure by relaxing the contraction in some of the cells, presumably in the trabecular meshwork. Um, it's a drug that's de developed from these kind of studies and there you have it. Now, We'll turn to the optic nerve, something I know a little more about. It, has, it was shown in experimental animals, monkeys, that intraocular pressure elevation caused a blockage of axonal transport, the first physiologic process to be shown to be affected by intraocular pressure. So what are we seeing here? Here, uh, the vitreous has been injected with radioactive leucine, an amino acid precursor of proteins. And proteins were synthesized in the Golgi apparatus of the retinal ganglion cells. And those proteins were carried along the axons into the optic nerve head uh and through the disc and into to all the way to the lateral geniculate process uh lateral geniculate body that process takes about four hours when what we're seeing here is that radioactive leucine has been taken up into protein and as it leaves the optic nerve it's hung up here each one of these white dots represents radioactivity. And they accumulate in the region of the lamina carosa when you elevate intraocular pressure. And that's the abnormality that occurs. This blockage is lethal, lethal to the ganglion cell because the transport occurs in both directions, both the direction I just indicated, but also get, getting signals from the lateral geniculate body. And if it doesn't get any signals from the lateral geniculate body, the cell goes into apoptosis. Apoptosis is a process where uh, the nucleus of the cell makes substances that dissolve the innards, the cytoplasm and the nucleus, and they are just kind of dissolved away. There's no inflammation or macrophages to carry stuff away. And that's what makes it different from necrosis, where you just kill the axons uh, and then something has to come in and clean it up, macrophages and inflammatory cells, and you get the retinal inflammation from that. This is a process where the retinal ganglion cell axons and cell bodies simply dissolve away. How does that happen? Well, two theories, one mechanical, and the other ischemic. The mechanical idea is that by kinking the axons that are going through the scleral canal and the lamina cribrosa, or else a pressure gradient along the axon might uh, be responsible. The contrary viewpoint uh, or an additional viewpoint was that uh, ischemia was a problem because the transport um, is dependent on metabolic oxidation and ATP. And if ischemia is due to vascular consequences of intraocular pressure elevation, then it might uh, cause this ischemia and there would be uh, blockage of axonal transport. Some evidence for that is that if you give angiotensin a vasoconstrictor, uh, which can seep in from the choroid into the optic nerve. Elsewhere, it doesn't seep in because there is blood-brain barrier, but it can come in through the choroid into the optic nerve head. And that causes a vasoconstriction and uh, uh, amplifies this effect of uh, intraocular pressure-induced uh, blockage. So that, that was evidence that uh, 
ischemia was part of the process. Other evidence of blood flow include, include the fact that there's a relationship between the diastolic blood pressure and uh, cupping and hemodynamic crisis and nocturnal dips in blood pressure. All of these things point to the uh, there being uh, involvement of the vascular system. The ocular perfusion pressure has been uh, also implicated and studied considerably but not definitively, it's at least associated with glaucoma. The ocular perfusion pressure is measured as the uh, mean blood pressure minus the intraocular pressure. And you might ask why the intraocular pressure? Well, because venous pressure as it exits the eye has to be at least as high as the intraocular pressure or, el or else the vessels, the veins would collapse. They're partially constricted by the intraocular pressure which raises the pressure upstream and that's uh, why this is the ocular perfusion pressure. There's also a relationship of glaucomatous damage to migraine, vasospasm, um, and vascular dysregulation, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, there's some relationship to arteriosclerosis and other vascular occlusive disorders. So pretty much um, the... Uh, uh, idea is, in my mind at least, that ischemia is a big factor in the process of uh, causing glaucomatous cupping. Under development by, because of understanding apoptosis is uh, a method to make cells undergoing apoptosis, retinal ganglion cells, uh, make them fluorescent. And the fluorescent cells can be seen in retinal images and they can be counted. And the number of fluorescent cells reflects the uh, rate of progression and guide therapy. The rate of progression uh, being the number of cells at any given time that are, uh, that are uh, fluorescent and undergoing apoptosis. This is in development, probably won't be actually available cl used clinically for at least 10 years, if not 20. But it's interesting that this understanding of what goes on in the optic nerve uh, will lead. So what is the effect of intraocular pressure on the capillary blood flow? This is an experiment that was done in 10 normal subjects in which the intraocular pressure was raised artificially to, a diff to a different levels while measuring blood flow. Blood flow remains stable even though the blood pressure is raised, even though the intraocular pressure is raised up as high as 50 millimeters of mercury. But you do eventually reach a point where the blood flow drops. After you release the, the intraocular pressure by stages, why the uh, blood flow returns in stages overshoots a little bit because of hyperemia, but eventually comes back to a normal state. That's what happened in eight of the 10 subjects. However, in two of the normal subjects, the blood flow rate fell progressively as you raised the intraocular pressure and then recovered Huh. The proportion here that is 20%, 20% of the subjects is interesting in that it relates to the approximate proportion of people with ocular hypertension who have damage to the disc and visual field loss. Remember, there were more people that had elevated pressure and no damage to the disc than there were people that had damage to the disc. That's an interesting but not conclusive uh, correlation. So what's the uh, pathogenic elements in ischemia? Well, a deficient local auto metabolic autoregulation, which some people have, is a deficiency in responsiveness to a low oxygen level, 
a high carbon dioxide level, pH, and adenosine. All of these factors have been demonstrated experimentally. There could also be episodic <clears throat> reperfusion injury. That is to say, if you have an injury by transient ischemia, there would be reperfusion if the uh, injury hadn't been lethal. And the reperfusion uh, causes some uh, radical ions that uh, can injure the cells. And there may be over and over again, eventually more and more injury to the axons. That's a different way of producing damage as a result of ischemia. <clears throat> so you can contrast ocular hypertension with normal tension glaucoma as we did before. And although intraocular pressure participates, yay, there is a variation in how much harm comes from the intraocular pressure. Reduced blood flow should result from a lowered arterial venous pressure difference as you raise the intraocular pressure and therefore the venous pressure. But autoregulation downstream from the arteries maintains the blood flow with normal autoregulation. And that's what happens here, but not here. Autoregulation is to be distinguished from other kinds of regulation. It's an adjustment of the blood vessels locally in response to local conditions, including ischemia from uh, disease conditions or change in local metabolic needs. And what I mean here is that if the retina is being having a flashing light and there's a signal sent to the lateral genicular body every time. Um, the light goes on and every time it goes off, it requires more metabolic energy to make all those action potentials. And therefore the local metabolic rate is increased and blood flow increases. That can be demonstrated by the blood flow measurements uh, when you have uh, that flashing light. Neuronal control, uh, the vessels in the, in the eye, the retina anyway, are not innervated. And so they're not controlled at all by nervous control as happens in some other parts of the body. Uh, and it's also in contrast to the particularly autonomic nervous control and uh, autonomic system changes uh, in, the, in the hormones, adrenaline and so on. Uh, these are all not autoregulation, they're regulation that come from outside the uh, vascular bed. Whereas the metabolic state affects the local constriction of blood vessels or dilation uh, in order to make sure that the metabolic needs are done. What are the signs of dysregulation? What are the things where the regulation goes wrong? Well, cold hands and feet when you're nervous or a cold, put one hand in cold water and the other hand gets cold and has vasoconstriction. Some people wear socks when they're sleeping uh, at night in order to keep their feet from getting cold. They tend to have low blood pressure, at least when they're young. So they might have a blood pressure of 100 over 60 instead of the normal 120 over 80. Although when they get older, they can get hypertension superimposed. There's a reduced sense of thirst. They get hungry, but they don't ever get thirsty. The only reason they drink water is to wash food down or because they know that they should. Uh, but they don't have a sensation of thirst. Migraine, prolonged sleep latency, it takes them a long time to go to sleep. Most people within five or 10 minutes, but some people can take half an hour or an hour. Although I haven't seen it as a thing that is associated with dysregulation, tinnitus is described. Anyway, not everybody who has dysregulation has all of these symptoms, but they are clinical questions that you can ask of a person in order to determine whether or not they might have dysregulation and thus be susceptible to intraocular pressure, um, even in the normal range. There are also uh, some clinical tests that can be done by immersing a hand in cold water and looking at the capillaries directly in the fingernail beds under magnification. And you can tell whether or not the person has a reaction to uh, 
that an uh, excessive reaction, and that's part of dysregulation. <clears throat> We've already mentioned that other considerations besides ischemia is reperfusion injury. There can also be activation of astrocytes. And uh, interestingly, two types of glaucoma can be recognized. One type is due to atherosclerosis or uh, thrombosis in the uh, major arteries uh, manifest by stroke or a heart attack. Uh, either in the person or in their family. And they tend to have their damage unrelated to the disc, unrelated intraocular pressure, which is interesting. It's the dysregulation people where changing the intraocular pressure has an effect on, um, on the disc damage. This isn't fully sorted out yet. It needs to be because it could be that there's no point in lowering the intraocular pressure in the first group, whereas the second group definitely is uh, affected by benefit, get, gets benefit from lowering the intraocular pressure. We're going to see that later when we discuss the normal tension glaucoma study, but yet to be sorted out is exactly whether this first group benefits any from uh, lowering intraocular pressure and whether the pressure is involved or th that's just simply another way that the optic nerve can be damaged and cupped. Do you have a question? Well, with no more questions, let's take a break.